What I didn't expect because we were so high is how much of space you could see around Earth. And then I saw a moon rise. I saw the moon come from around Earth and it just caused me to look outwards. So that was unexpected, seeing the moon like that relative to Earth. And it just made me want to say, like, we got to get the heck out there. I mean, we are so small. I don't know if people can really understand in the grand scheme of the universe, you know, how minute we are out there. And that there is so much interesting that we have to learn. And we have no idea how it will alter humankind's history from here forward. Again, it's like explaining someone from the 1800s how an iPhone will make your life better. They can't comprehend it. Impossible. We're in the exact same space, uh, exact same situation when we try and understand what the universe can teach us. And you just feel really energized to get out there and go find whatever it is that exists out there. And maybe that is other, other intelligent life. I don't want to share someone else's thoughts. I want to create my own original thoughts. I want to create my own original solutions. I want to look at situations and come up with my own phrasing, my own words, and do it my way. This is the John Taffer Podcast. Shut it down! Hello, hello. I am John Taffer. Welcome to the John Taffer Podcast. And before I get going, if you haven't subscribed to my podcast, you can do so right now. Any place where you subscribe to your podcast, make sure you do that. And... If you ever want to email me beyond the podcast, communicate with me about something about the podcast, never hesitate to send me an email at podcast at johntaffer.com. That's podcast at johntaffer.com. And yes, I do love hearing from you. <clears throat> this podcast this week has me incredibly excited. As you know, guys, I'm not doing podcasts every week now because we're back in production on Bar Rescue. Here's a little inside information. I'm not even sure if I'm supposed to say this, Corey. Hmm. So I might be breaking my contractual rules, we'll but see. I did agree last week to do 25 more Bar Rescue episodes this year for Paramount. So uh, we go to work in a couple of weeks. We're starting production again and uh, 25 episodes. I'll be in production, Corey, from next week, pretty much except for a holiday break, straight through to the end of July. So, you know, those of you uh, uh, who haven't heard me talk about this before, that's the kind of commitment that Bar Rescue is. So I'm going to be on the road now for six months, basically, to do this show. But this year, I'm doing it different. I'm taking Nicole and my dog, uh, Bentley, with us. Oh, there you go. You won't be so lonely on the road. Yeah, so with my new Airstream van. Yeah. Oh, you're not going to take the RV? Uh, no, we're not going to take the big one. We're going to take the little Airstream van, and we're gotcha. going to... We're starting in Dallas, then we go to Atlanta, then we head down to Florida. And then we're hitting some other great cities that I'm excited about this year, Charlotte uh, um, and a few others that escape me at the moment. But So podcasts are going to happen now about once a month or so, sometimes every three weeks when I have a chance because production is so difficult and it's hard to do the podcast every week while I'm in production and traveling. So this week is very, very special. You know, a lot of you might have seen the inspiration for spaceflight that launched on September 15th. And first civilian spaceflight, and, you know, we've seen Bezos go up and we've seen Branson go up. And, you know, these are spacecraft that go up and come right back down again. They don't orbit. They don't go to the space station. They don't do anything. But the SpaceX system is a true spacecraft. It goes up to the space center, Corey, and it drops supplies at the space center. Uh, and uh, in the case of Inspiration4, they're going up above the space center. Right. Uh, so they're going higher than the Space Center, the highest we've ever gone uh, since we've been to the moon. And they're going to orbit for a couple of days and then come back down and do a splashdown. So it's a real space mission with, with the way up there, breaking away from the, the boosters to orbit and then to uh, turn around, stop your, your, your motion and free fall down to Earth. Pretty damn exciting. Well, a dear, dear friend of mine who owns a company called Shift 4, and I happen to use their POS systems. You've seen them on, my, uh, on Bar Rescue. Uh, they own Posi Touch and Harbor Touch and, and all those POS system companies. He decided that he, through his friendship with Elon Musk, could put together the first civilian space flight, but he only wanted to do it if he could do some good for the world. So he decided he was going to bring four, three other civilians up with him for a total of four, and that he would try to raise $200 million for St. Jude's Children's Jeez. Hospital in this process. And to Jared, it was more about raising the $200 million than going to space. But Jared's an interesting guy because he was a, a pilot, and he owns a bunch of planes, and he has an experimental pilot license. And I only say this because he's not in the studio yet because he'd kill me if he heard me say this. He reminds me very much of a Howard Hughes. He's a pilot. He loves planes. He loves aeronautics, and, and he owns a bunch of companies, and he's hugely successful and extremely wealthy. 
I believe he's the Howard Hughes, Howard Hughes of our time. I would say he's a very humble guy as well. And he's an extremely humble guy. He doesn't like being called a billionaire. He doesn't like any of those kinds of titles. You know, he wants to just be Jared, and he is. And I'm honored to call Jared my friend. So in a couple of minutes, Jared Isaacman's going to be here. Jared was Commander Isaacman. He was the commander of Inspiration 4. Think about this. Six months in a, in a simulator, Corey, showing you everything that could go wrong. <laughs> Yeah. Right, so creating this failure, that failure, the pressure of that, the fear of that, then think about walking down a ramp to get in that rocket. Yeah, and the rumbling is before ignition, and then the way up, and then when it, when the the stage breaks loose and you right. get that jolt up there that the so I have so much to talk to Jared about, not only about business, not only about what it's like to go to space, but how does something that's so big and so important even happen? Jared brought space travel back to the public eye again. He got young people interested in it again. He's done a huge amount of media work to bring attention to this and help continue to raise money for St. Jude. He's my friend. He's a great guy. He's Commander Isaacman, and he'll be with me in a minute. Don't shut down this podcast. John Taffer will be right back. Corey, we got to talk about this company. Big ass fans, BAF we call them. They're all over the Vegas airport and restaurants, schools, gyms, military bases, everywhere around here. And it seems like you can't get away from them. And they don't just do big ass fans. They're the best fans for your house and patio. And they even have these evaporative coolers that are perfect for places like Las Vegas and maybe where you are during the summer too. If you haven't seen them, check them out. Go check the website. You'll never guess the name of the website, Corey. Bigassfans.com. So check it out, Bigassfans. Dot com. That's BigAssFans.com. Jared, how are you, my friend? I'm doing well, John. You know, this is special for me because not only have you been in the news and run such a great company that we do business with, but you and I have been friends for years. So to have a buddy here who is mission commander uh, of Inspiration4 is really incredible. And, and I've been so looking forward to this interview. You know, when you started in business and you came up with this idea when you were young, to give away credit card terminals. And you thought it was silly that restaurants paid back then, I think it was about $30 you'd pay for a little square credit card processing terminal. Per month. Per month, that's yeah. right. <laughs> and, and you came up with that. Why, why wouldn't we give them that and and uh, uh, make the money on a credit card processing? And you were how old when you came up with that conclusion? I was 16. Yeah, 16. And then you sort of got in business with your dad then. Mm -hmm. You didn't even drive yet, right? So your dad drove you around and you started giving away these credit card terminals. And you built a base of a lot of credit card terminals. Now you're 17, 18, 19. When did you realize that this was going to be a, 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 your future, that this was going to be a really significant business, more than just a kid uh, uh, starting a business? Yeah, so I so we started the company in 1999. That's when I was 16. And, uh, yeah, the idea was just start solving pain points for customers. Um, you know, so many, you know, vendor relationships create more problems than they solve. So let's see if we can solve some pain points, differentiate from everyone else in the payment space and, and, and win the trust of a lot of, a, a lot of our customers. But of course, like you said, at 16, you know, is that, um, you know, is that what you're going to do the rest of your life? I probably didn't think that at that time, but I'd say about by the time I was 18, within two years of starting the company, we were getting such momentum and traction out there. I was like, you know, this is, um, th this could be something pretty significant, but I, I certainly never expected. I mean, today we process a quarter of a trillion a year in payments. Like I could not have imagined a number like that, uh, yeah. you know, 20 years ago. Not even fathomable. No, you? no, not at all. So, so, um, you created then the POS system, Harbor mm -hmm. Touch. And then you moved into the space where I'm not going to just give them a credit card terminal. I'm going to give them a whole POS system for free to get. And then you disrupted the entire industry. And yeah. that's when you became known as a disruptor, I would say. And then you came into the marketplace. And that's when you and I met really years ago. And I fell in love with you as a disruptor. I said, you know, why would I want anybody to pay for a POS system if they can get it for free? You're going to pay for credit card processing either way. So it, it is truly free. And uh, then, you know, we created a little friendship and, and, and a working relationship together. And now you've acquired Restaurant Manager, PosiTouch, uh, all of these other POS systems. You've now created SkyTab, mm -hmm. all of these wireless networks. So from that vision of giving away a terminal, 
you are really a technology company now. Oh, yeah. I mean, we went from solving pain points for restaurants to hotels, to stadiums, to golf courses, to e-commerce companies and healthcare. I mean, it's uh, a substantial portion of commerce in this country right now um, is touching some form of shift for payment technology. And, and that's the word right there is technology. That's how you're solving those pain points. Yeah. And as we get more and more into digital currency and less and less paper currency, I'm guessing the processing world just keeps growing and growing and growing. Well, for sure. That's one of the tailwinds. I mean, there's there's a few. I mean, there's going to be less cash and more digital forms of payment. Uh, and then there's also a lot of older companies out there that have, you know, stopped trying to solve uh, for pain points for their customers. And they're creating more of them and they're losing customers, which are coming over to services like Shift4. So, um, you know, we, we grew our payment volume double digit during the pandemic with a lot of our customers being restaurants and hotels. And that's not because our restaurant and hotel customers were immune to the pandemic. It's because they were leaving solutions that weren't taking good care of them and they were gravitating over to shift for. Yeah. So now you you have, and I can say this because I don't want you to blush, you have the finest processing company. You are for the finest transactional software and hardware in the industry. And now you become a leader. Okay. So now you're hugely successful. You came up with an idea as a young kid. It panned out. You made a bunch of money. Now you say to yourself, and I know you well, Jared, what can I do that would help the world? You're a really charitable and humble guy, one of the most that I know. And you took your wealth and you connected with Elon Musk. And how did Inspiration4 happen? Yeah, I mean, well, look, to, to begin the story, you get, I, when I was five years old, I said I wanted to go to space. I mean, I was just totally enamored by those picture books of the space shuttle and the stories of Mercury and Gemini and Apollo and Skylab. And, uh, you know, it was always super fascinating. That's why um, when I needed uh, some therapy away from work uh, about 16 years ago, I said, I'm going to start flying. And I started flying a lot and flew air shows and flew record flights around the world, all of which too, to, to raise money for Make-A-Wish Foundation and other charitable causes. I started a defense aerospace uh, business. So so if I'm not mistaken, you have an experimental pilot license, correct? I do. Yeah. So, so you are an extremely experienced pilot. I'm def I'm guessing you've dealt with crises in the air. I have. Equipment breakdown and failure. But what's amazing is, and I want to interrupt you and get that in before you say, talk about your Air Force, if you would. Yeah, so uh, back in uh, 2011, I was flying air shows. Um, we had a civilian demonstration team uh, flying jet aircraft, seven aircraft flying 18 inches apart, just like the Thunderbirds or Blue Angels. In fact, we had two former Thunderbirds on our team. Uh, and, um, and we, we did it because it was a great challenge. It was exciting to energize people to crowd, but we also did it to, to raise awareness for the make a wish foundation. And we, we brought uh, wish kids out to every one of our shows. It was really fun. Um, but it's high risk flying. And we said, you know, maybe there's a way to pivot this into something that has real commercial value to this country. Um, and the idea is to basically stand up a force of fighter aircraft to be professional adversaries, to be a sparring partner for the U.S. government because you can do it at substantially lower costs and to create a really challenging environment. Uh, and that grew, you know, from a concept into, you know, at the time that, you know, we sold the business a couple of years ago, it was a $6 billion industry and it was saving taxpayers a lot of money and, it, and most importantly, it was helping the warfighter um, prepare for conflicts of the future. So when you think about that kind of vision, so you then went out and traveled around the world buying fighter planes. Mm -hmm. And if I'm not mistaken, because I think you told me this story years ago, when you bought your first MiG and you tried to bring a MiG into the country or something, you really, you, you, you were creating something that hadn't been done before. Oh, yeah. And I, we always kind of were talking, uh, you know, around the conference table. We're like, so we have all the right permits and regulations to import what became the world's largest private air force. We import over 100 aircraft. And I was like, but can you imagine that the customs agent at the port who sees all these fighter jets getting offloaded off of a boat, even if the paperwork's in order, you got to imagine that person's on the phone like, hey, somebody come down here. This doesn't I'm, look right. I'm not signing off on this, <laughs> you know. Um, but anyway, again, it was uh, it's it's a great business right now. And it's still um, it's actually based here in Las Vegas. Most yeah. of the fighters are in uh, Nellis Air Force Base. Yeah, I had the opportunity a couple years ago. Yeah. You set up a tour for me. I went out and I saw it. It's incredible to see Jared's fighters all lined up. And I got a chance to meet some of the pilots which were right out of central casting, by the way. I mean, these guys looked like Top Gun pilots. And, and they, they all are. They're all best of the best. Yeah, it's incredible. So so now you have your pilot background. Mm -hmm. You love flying. You're an experienced pilot. You're a really good pilot. I'm guessing you flew yourself here this weekend, right? And you're going to fly yourself home? <laughs> I I, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I fly a fair amount, yes. Yes. But uh, <laughs> uh, So how did Inspiration4 start now? 
So uh, for a long time, I've been keeping an eye on the commercial space industry with the idea that, you know, at some point or another, uh, space flight would no longer be the exclusive domain of world superpowers. That eventually, just like the early days of commercial aviation, that, you know, it would there would be less regulation and it would open it up more for for, you know, everybody to potentially participate in it. And uh, so I, you know, periodically would ping SpaceX and just say, you know, if there is an opportunity, um, you know, I'd love the chance. And and it was just, geez, a year, not even a year ago, uh, if you can think how fast SpaceX works, they hadn't even launched the first operational NASA mission uh, since the shuttle was retired in a decade. And um, we worked out this idea where um, it would be the first all-civilian mission. And the moment I heard that it was going to be the first, then it, you know, it just became very significant about, geez, who are we going to take and what is this going to represent and what are we going to accomplish and, and is it going to matter? Um, and that was all the kind of, you know, early days of Inspiration4. And yeah, it went from a concept to actually orbiting in space for three days and coming back in less than a year. You know, it's interesting. Some people you read these articles about rich guys going into space, rich guys going into space. If this didn't mean something, if you didn't raise the dollars for St. Jude or accomplish some similar objective, you wouldn't have done wouldn't it. Wouldn't have done it. Not, no way. It's like, it, it, you know, and people, I, I understand why in, in various, you know, news articles, like the, the whole, you know, rich people going to space thing. It's like, well, first of all, it's obvious that space is expensive. Like right from the start. I mean, there's a reason why it's only been America, Russia, and China that have put human beings into orbit. Superpowers, right? It is expensive. But so were computers in the 60s and so were cell phones in the 80s or 90s. You know, at some point, these costs come down. Uh, as you, you know, create more demand and more scale and you can recoup some of those in early investments. But while it is expensive and it's obvious that it's expensive, you know, what did the mission try and accomplish? You know, did it represent something bigger? Did it make it a positive or profound impact on the world? Um, you know, that's, that's how I looked at this. And, and I think, you know, having the largest fundraising effort for St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, over $250 million raised, um, you know, taking people up that never would have had a chance to go into space before that showed it was possible and going past the space station, a very important, significant step towards getting to the moon and Mars. Those things did matter. And, and I think that like the actual who paid for the mission, and what it cost is, is largely irrelevant in that context. Two hundred and fifty million dollars for St. Jude, the yep. largest single donation they have ever gotten. Yep. Boy, what an incredible thing. Think of the impact that will have for generations. So, okay, so you come up with the idea for this mission. And I know because I got a call from you back then, John, would I help you judge one of the seats? Yeah. Who came up with the structure of what e what would each seat would be and, and, and how you'd structure the crew? Yeah, it was right from the beginning. I mean, you know, pe people do ask a lot of, you know, did this take months to come up with? It was like, no, it, it this all falls in the camp of doing the right thing. And something like this, you're going to do the right thing. And you're going to have a, an important uh, charitable component. That was always going to be St. Jude. Um, and, and then it was like, well, who are the crew members and what should they represent? And, and they shouldn't all be the same person. They shouldn't all look the same person. They should all have a very inspiring story for their own audience in their own right. So I wanted a great humanitarian that could symbolize, uh, hope. So that became a, a St. Jude, uh, uh, children's research hospital physician assistant who herself had cancer as a child, Haley. overcame it, helped other kids do it. Yep, you're um, referring to Haley. Yeah, that's Haley Arsenault, our yep. medical officer. You know, Chris Sembroski, he just made a donation to St. Jude on our website and got randomly selected. And then there was a portion that you you were so helpful with, which is uh, the, the person who would represent prosperity, an entrepreneur. Because I know as an entrepreneur, it's really hard to take in an idea and shine a light on it and get yeah. it noticed and make a difference. And, and it turns out not only is she an entrepreneur, she's an artist, she's a poet, uh, she's a she's a geoscientist. I mean, she's a great human being. Okay, so now you're the flight experience person on board. Right. I want to ask you a couple of fun questions, if sure. I can, that I know everybody who's listening wants to ask you. When you when you're in the simulator, mm -hmm. and you're in the simulator for months, right? Oh yeah. And in the simulator, they don't give you a good day. They give you a rough day. I mean, they have every failure they can possibly happen, and they layer failure on top of failure. So in the simulator, you're learning all the terrible things that could happen to you while you're up there. Correct. Did it make you more scared? No, it made you more confident. Um, you know, when we were on orbit, uh, we were with out, of, uh, out of communication for um, about 15% uh, of the flight. We had no, no comms. It's just, you know, even in, even in 2021, yep. you don't have, you know, universal coverage up there with satellites and ground stations. And you felt comfortable. We, we did have alarms that went off. And, and you didn't panic. You felt comfortable. Um, and... Anything that could have unforeseen developed that could have extended our stay, 
we would have been happy to work through it because of such extensive training. And yeah, you throw the worst at you so that even the little things that come up, you just feel really well prepared for. So now you're, you're, you're walking down the ramp and you're getting into the capsule. How do you feel? I was pretty charged up, uh, honestly. Um, but I think throughout the whole thing from, from, you know, preparation through launch and splashdown, I was just really focused on the mission of what we set out to accomplish because you know how precious every minute on orbit is. Um, and you just want to get it right. So when I was walking down, you know, the crew access arm to get in, I was like, what are the things we need to get right right now in order to make sure the next steps go perfect? And I kind of just kept sequencing things out like that throughout the whole mission. Boy, you a mission commander. That's exactly how you were thinking. She took it step by step, objective by objective. And you had that type of a focus as you went through it. Fascinating. So, okay, you sit down in your seat. The steam is coming up the <laughs> side of the rocket. I'll try to give the picture. You're sitting there and you're waiting. Mm -hmm. How do you feel then? Uh, so there's a period of time where you're, you, you got nothing going on. Uh, so they build in so much time in the schedule. So if somebody's, you know, suit was ripped or there was a cable, you could have time to fix it. Uh, so there's about uh, an hour and a half from when you get strapped in where, you know, you're just, you're just chilling. And uh, so uh, Dr. Proctor, who's sitting next to me, she, she was piping over her iPad, um, you know, the score of Star Wars. Uh, so we had some we had, we had some good entertainment there, but then in the last call it forty five minutes, that's where I say Dragon comes alive, um, and that's when you arm your launch escape system and the propellant starts coming in, and that is a lot of noise um, and it's a lot of sensation and vibration as you are filling that thing uh, with liquid oxygen and RP one which is going to create, in a very short period of time, a controlled explosion, explosion. and accelerate you up into orbit. Um, and that's where, you know, you, there's a little bit of nerves. It's also fascination because the simulator can't create that. Right. You can't hear those noises Sounds, and right, that and rumble. Feeling, so right. you're like, this is interesting, and it's fascinating. Yeah. So you mentioned to me that when, when you go up, that they told you in training it was going to feel like an old truck on a bumpy road. Yes. So now you take off, and it's slow. Mm -hmm, that's so right. So you're accelerating, accelerating. How did it feel on the way up? Was it like a, a truck in a bumpy road? No, I think it was a lot smoother than that. Um, so you're, yeah, I certainly wouldn't have described it that. You're, you're pretty far away from the engines, so you don't really feel much. When you get on the second stage, which is just one engine right behind mm -hmm. you, uh, there's a little bit more of a vibration. But probably the most like noticeable thing, and, and I know you've heard this from others before, is, is that stage separation. When the first stage falls away and then the second stage fires up, that is, um, that's like imagine going, I don't know, um, supersonic in your car and slamming on the best brakes in the world and coming. <laughs> you are just thrown forward. Uh, and then you're just hanging there hoping that second stage motor fires because if it doesn't, you're coming back down pretty quick. Um, and once it kicks, gets going, then you know you're in pretty good shape to get to orbit. Okay, you get to orbit. Mm -hmm. Engine shut down. Mm -hmm. Is it as silent once the engine shuts down as you think it is? It is. It is. And uh, Dragon generally has like a lot of good white noise going, if you will. There's a lot of pumps and fans that are going on, and uh, it, it, it. You don't even you notice them when you're living there, but when the second stage shuts off and you're just there, it does feel very quiet. Right. And it and the best sensation to describe this is it's like hanging upside down on your bed for three days. It, that blood rush into your head feeling, it you instantly feel that uh, when you get on orbit. Really, we didn't talk. So, so you you really feel? Do you get a headache from that? Some people do. Wow. Um, there is huge fluid shifts in your body um, up towards uh, basically the upper half of your body because you don't have gravity to pull it down. Right. That's why your face can look a little puffy when you see people on camera at the space station. It you feel differently. There's no. Um, really no way to, to say it. Otherwise, it, it, you are kind of a different person physiologically when you're on, on orbit. So if I can ask this question, I can't, I can't believe I'm going to ask this, but I'm going to. So when you go to pee, mm -hmm. does it come out like it would on ground or do you have to push it out? I mean, is there a different, I'm just curious. It, it, it's such a good question. So, uh, I was very, um, very diligent with my notes. Um, you know, I had, uh, pages of debrief notes and, and I do remember the first time I was like, wow, it, uh, it feels like you're going forever. I mean, I, I you know I don't know how many uh, football fans you got listening <laughs> in this, but you know you ever the time where you're like, I'm gonna wait through the the first and second quarter of the big game, and then you, <laughs> and it you, you know it's this endless stream or something. That's kind of what it feels like. It it, it it is different. And then um, I'd say after you know two two times or so, you kind of work it out. But it, it is different. Wow. So it was the first non professional space flight in history, and you're in the history books. Do you feel uh? 
when you landed, and I, of course, I, Jared and I just had lunch together, so I did get a chance to ask him a couple of questions. And this was a great first question I asked you, and, and the answer was interesting. You have a day-to-day job. Now, Jared's day-to-day job is pretty terrific. He gets to travel, and he gets to run a great company. And I know his team. He works with great, great people. So now he goes to space, and it's the biggest thing of his life. Now you come back down to Earth. Is everything small again? Is is your job, does your life seem more trivial after something so powerful? It, it, yeah, I mean, I'd be lying if I said there isn't an adjustment. There is. Um and uh, everyone in the crew felt it in a different way. You, you are ramping super fast. You're, you're not on normal Earth time. You're on SpaceX time. And SpaceX does things in months that other companies do in years. So you're living that super fast pace, and you're building up to this big event, and then you come back, and it kind of stops. And, uh, you know, I remember just deleting all my standing calls from my calendar. And, you know, Haley, you know, she was unpacking her medical officer shirt. And she's like, I wonder if I'll wear this again. It it is this feeling of like, wow, I was just part of something so big and now it slows down. But then you shift to, well, part of my job now is to tell people about this experience and share it, you know, and, and be an advocate for the commercial space industry. So it's not four people going to space. It's 40 and then 400 and then 4,000. Yeah, and that's what's really exciting. So you guys trained for six months, a little under six months, mm-hmm. and, and you felt that the training could be shorter uh, as we go, g- get better and better at this. Well, I, I think for it's vehicle specific. So I actually was saying with Dragon, I think it, it potentially could be longer. So we mirrored the same program that NASA went through. It's the same vehicle, it's the same control systems. And you have to know how to operate that. But I do think they benefit in some ways. Um, you know, having a, a physician assistant as a medical officer uh, that was great. I, I think that the medical training would have been longer if we didn't have her there. Sure. I think, you know, some of the avionics things, you know, my aviation background, you know, even Dr. Proctor, she's a pilot as well. That that was helpful for us and helpful for the training curriculum. I think you have to design a different vehicle. Um, and that's what Starship is. That's your hundred people. That's getting you closer to that 747 where, you know, maybe you don't need months of training, um, you know, but but you still will need more training. It, it will always be different than, you know, commercial space flight to, or commercial aviation you know to a great extent so these are some fun facts you might not even know some of these so let's see if i can fire some at you it was the first all civilian human space flight to orbit it was the first black female spacecraft pilot yep. it was the youngest american in space first person to fly to space with a prosthetic yes a uh, farthest flight for a human space flight since the hubble missions first time spacex has operated three dragons in space First free flight of Dragon spacecraft on a human spaceflight mission. The largest contiguous window uh, ever flown in space. First splashdown of a Dragon crew in the Atlantic Ocean. First thrice flown Dragon 9 booster to launch a human space flight mission. So that rocket had been used three other times. Two two times before we were the third flight, yes. And that NASA hasn't signed off yet on theirs to do that yet. So that was a big envelope expansion. But that's what made Elon's program so yeah. powerful. I, that's, of course. And watching that baby land vertically is, is absolutely incredible. First, uh, during the Inspiration4 mission, uh, uh, Isaacman made history by making the first known sports bet from space, <laughs> placing two bets on NFL football with Bet MGM Sportsbook while over Las Vegas. Did they, you win? So, well, one of them did win because it was that night. It was Thursday night football. And the other was the Eagles to win the Super Bowl, which, uh, they, just to be clear, this was a casual thing. I was talking <laughs> to my brother from space. He was in mission control. And I was like, hey, you know, I'm a football guy, and the last few months have disappeared. I forgot that football's on. Hey, put put a bet on the Eagles. And and then it turned into this, uh, you know, big, big thing that hadn't been done before. But you know what I said? All proceeds are going to St. Jude, so... And I got a couple of fun questions for you, yeah. buddy. So here we go. What's it like eating in space and drinking? Uh, so eating is very normal other than your food is floating. Uh, so you want to be pretty cognizant yeah. of like high crumb factor because uh, yep. you don't want crumbs everywhere. Yep. Other than that, it's fine. And pe- Some people say it tastes different. It tasted fine to me. Uh, drinking, yeah, I mean, you, you, you basically have like uh, squeeze bottles, if you will, so that, you know, you don't have liquid all over the capsule. <laughs> Can you drink carbonated beverages in a spacecraft? Not that I'm aware of, no. Uh, so we so Taffer Seltzer's out of the question. I don't think so. Ah, uh, too bad. How do you brush your teeth in space? So uh, same way you do on Earth. Uh, they give you a toothpaste you can swallow or you can spit it in a rag. I was more in the spit rag camp. Um, I didn't <laughs> really want to try something new in my stomach, so I, uh, I didn't swallow it. 
And what was sleeping like? You talked a little about that before over, over lunch. You had a hard time sleeping. Yeah, it, you know, it's just uh, it, it depends what kind of person you are. If you if you sleep on your back normally at night, you're gonna love it. And all the NASA astronauts say the same thing. But if you like to kind of cocoon, you know, wrap up in your blanket and pillow, you're not getting that in microgravity. Um, and what happens is your body just straightens out like a board, and um, and that. That's not usually that. That's not always the most comfortable for some people. So, gotcha. but it, it's fine. You're so exhausted at the end of every day. You just you just go wipe out. So. Gotcha. And you guys are busy. You were doing experiments all day long. All day. Yeah. Incredible. So this is my wife wanted me, Nicole, one who you know well wanted me to ask you this question. Nicole watches Ancient Aliens, right? She's read every article on it. Did you see anything up there? You know, I did not see anything <laughs> uh, unexpected uh, at all. But um, you know, you know what? Let me change that. I saw a lot of people talk about the overview effect of seeing Earth without borders and how fragile it is. And, um, you know, it gives them new perspectives. I kind of expected the world to look like that. What I didn't expect because we were so high is how much of space you could see around Earth. And then I saw a moon rise. I saw the moon come from around Earth. And it just caused me to look outwards. So that was unexpected, seeing the moon like that relative to Earth. And it just made me want to say, like, we got to get the heck out there. I mean, we are so small. I don't know if people can really understand in the grand scheme of the universe, you know, how minute we are out there. And that there is so much interesting that we have to learn. And we have no idea how it will alter humankind's history from here forward. Again, it's like explaining someone from the 1800s how an iPhone will make your life better. They can't comprehend it. Impossible. We're in the exact same space, uh, exact same situation when we try and understand what the universe can teach us. And you just feel really energized to get out there and go find whatever it is that exists out there. And maybe that is other other intelligent life. Yeah. Do you believe there's life out there? I think it's I, I think it's hard not to imagine that it is, that, it, that, that we're alone. It's just too, There's just too much of it. I feel like the odds Agreed. favor it. I agree. I agree. It, it, it statistically, it would seem crazy for there not to be. Okay, just a couple more fun ones. Uh, describe the first time you saw the entire Earth at once in the world. Did you? Was there a, like a holy shit moment? It, it, when we went into the cupola, which is that largest uh, continuous window in space, we, we saw the Earth in a way that no one else has ever seen it. You know, even when you do a spacewalk, you know, your actual frame of view is not that big. I mean, it's a, mm -hmm. a handful, you know, of, um, of clear glass, if you will, in front of you, versus this was, I mean, this was a glass dome, you know, the size of like your closet and you couldn't tell where the top is. Wow. So you just felt like your entire body was out there in space looking unobstructed at, at, at our world. Wow. Uh, and it is, it is, I mean, it's radiating energy. It is gorgeous looking. And yes, that was a holy shit moment. So you fell asleep looking at the stars, literally, <laughs> right? Uh, maybe. Was the spacesuit comfortable? <laughs> yes. Yeah, very comfortable. Uh, was anyone on the flight afraid of heights? <laughs> I mean, I'm a I'm a pretty high time pilot, and I don't particularly like being on top of a skyscraper, pressing my head against the window, or but, top of a ladder either. Yeah, I'm but I didn't mind being in the spacecraft, so I think everybody was okay. So you took a few things to space. Mm -hmm. If you were to go again, what would you bring to space with you this time? Honestly, I'd bring less. Um, <laughs> <laughs> really, I, I that was one of the debrief points. Is we brought a ton of stuff to space. You know, we brought a lot of flags, which were great. And I was like, why did we have to bring the flags that you put on buildings? You know, it's like impossible to pack those things again. We could have just brought little flags. Um, <laughs> you know, we, we brought, we, we honestly, we brought a lot. Um, a lot of it's getting donated and auctioned off at St. Jude in, a, in about a week, which is great. Um, there are important things, I think, to friends and family because, um, you know, they're going on this journey with you, too. Um, and they have a harder job watching you go right. up and know that, you know, some there are things that can go wrong. So taking little things, you know, wedding rings, pictures, letters, um, you know, watches that are meaningful and record videos of them for people in space. Uh, though That was worthwhile. That was time well spent, uh, yeah. for sure. But generally, less is better. You know, I got to tell you, as your buddy, I, I watched every minute of it. I read everything there was to read. I was worried about you. Yeah. You know, I was, and, and you find, you know, when a friend of yours is doing something like that, it's emotional for us all, you know, especially when we know you as well as you do. So how did it feel to, to hit your, your fundraising goal at $250 million? So it was pretty emotional. Um, we were all crying, and uh, I remember it because wow. it was right after Splashdown. Uh, we just, they let us see our families for about 20 minutes, and then we went to do some uh, bio-research tests which was a great thing because you needed some time to just process what just happened. And um, so we were all sitting around this conference table waiting for our turns with the docs. And then somebody said, hey, Elon just tweeted that he's in for 50. 
and we knew that put us over the 250 or the 200. Now we're over 250. And, um, and that's when it felt like we really accomplished our mission. And, yeah. and it's like, you know, um, Elon uh, inspires the whole world with the things he does. And um, it was just a realization, too, that with what we chose to do with Inspiration4, we inspired him. E- even though he enabled all the technology, he-, he felt at that moment that making a $50 million contribution to St. Jude's was the right thing. And um, wow. it meant a lot to us. Yeah. So, so uh, we were talking earlier about the future of space tech and the future of launching and, and how concerned you are that other countries are, you know, are close to landing on the moon and colonizing the moon and such. What do you think is our future now? Look, we, we you know, I, I have two perspectives on this. One is kind of just a citizen of the world, which is uh, I want the entire world energized to go out and explore among the stars. And I think there is so much for us all to learn that can bring humanity closer and make our world a better place. I truly believe that the more we go out and explore among space and learn what we can't even possibly fathom now, it'll be better for, for all of humanity. And also at the same time too, is like, I'm, I'm an American and I'm a patriot too. And, you know, we have national interests in space as well. And, um, and, and I am concerned that we are falling behind and, um, you know, that I think it would be a great, uh, travesty to let go of the, um, you know, it, basically the course that Kennedy charted, uh, charted for us long ago where America would accept this bold challenge in this new frontier and, and be a leader in it. And, uh, yeah, I, I am concerned that, um, that we won't be the first back to, to the moon. And, and I think we should be concerned. Yeah, I'm concerned as well. You know, when I was younger, I'm a little older than you. I remember the moon landing. I remember those spacewalks. And I look at our divisive country these days. You know, back then, the space program was a unifying factor. We all had something to root for. We all watched it. We were all excited about it. You know, it it homogeneously sort of connected us all. And, you know, I think we sort of need that again. We sort of need a space race again, something to be excited about. I think you've lit that spark, Jared. You know? I sure hope so. I, I, you know, whether it's uh, us or, or anyone, uh, this should be a unifying thing. And um, and it's a shame that even, you know, that divisive, you know, kind of culture that we've now sadly become accustomed to of late uh, has made its way to space. It shouldn't be that way. I mean, we know so much more about the earth and climate and predicting storms and saving lives and delivering information to the hardest reaches place in the world. Because I'll tell you, like the foundation for solving things like social inequality and, and health care and poverty and everything begins with connection and information, right? And space is allowing us to do that. You're not going to run a DSL line in the middle of the desert somewhere, but you have a satellite overhead that can deliver deliver that that information that can change everything um i think there was a navy seal who said you know the the way you solve the you know the problems in north korea is to parachute a bunch of iphones in and that's information that does that right so space can solve so much for the world but you know people can get wrapped up in a soundbite of well you know it's a it's a billionaires destroying the world and leaving it behind no that's wrong that's a, that's just it, it, it's picking an easy target instead of re- recognizing all the benefit that space can do for Earth. Um, who's ultimately paying for it is 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 really irrelevant, especially if it comes at a at a much lower cost for the taxpayers. You know. Well, who's ever paying for it? Thank God they're paying for yeah. it, because we cannot have this process, uh, this progress as a society and and through our technologies. So you've taken all of this, and and uh, uh, now we have SkyTap. So you've taken you're taking Shift Four. You're taking all the POS companies, all the technologies, all the market that you've acquired, and you're creating a whole new futuristic, and I can't wait, I'm hopefully going to be one of the first ones to get it, the new SkyTab POS system, Mm -hmm. which is the most technologically advanced in the world, which doesn't surprise me from Commander Isaacman. So uh, what what are you so excited about with the SkyTab system? Coming back to Earth now. Yeah, you know, look, I, I and it, well, coming back to Earth, but going away for just a second. I, I spent six, actually, almost a year of my life um, connected to what I think is the most well-run and innovative organization in the world, which is SpaceX. And they do things differently than everybody else. And that's why they have different results than everyone else. Uh, so it would be irresponsible, the CEO of a public company, a company I love, not to take some of these tidbits back, some of this good information and say, we got to apply this here to how we do things. Um, and you know, part of that philosophy is we, if you have five products, but you can do the same with one product better, 
you get a lot of efficiency games out of it. You can iterate faster. You can improve it faster. So yeah, we're, we're taking, you know, maybe four or five different restaurant POS solutions we have, and we're putting it all together in a far better, more capable, innovative solution that's got less parts in it. And if you have less parts, you have less things that can break. Right. Um, and it'll be a better experience for, for our customers too. So that's, that's one very exciting thing that I am excited to get in your hands. Um, but it's one of many that we're trying to work on right now. Yeah. It's interesting. So, so being exposed to the technology and the culture at SpaceX was, was uh, the greatest company you've ever seen. Greatest one I've ever seen. Wow. Very powerful to say that. So is Elon a motivator or, or, or is he a push man? Well, I think he's um, a little both. Maybe I think he's a little bit of both too. But it all begins with an unbelievable vision and mission that people really believe in. I mean, he attracts unbelievable talent that says, "I don't want to do anything else in life other than work at SpaceX or work at you know Tesla or Neuralink." You know, there are people there who say, "Like, I, I don't, I don't." You know, the the greatest satisfaction I'll ever get in life is if if I can convert contribute to a, a chip that'll go into someone's head that'll that'll make somebody walk again or make somebody see again or make somebody hear again. That's Neuralink as an example. But the, the workforce is the same way at Tesla as is SpaceX, as is all of his companies, is everybody has genuine belief that they're making a contribution to the world that they'll never be able to do anywhere else. And then from there, having that that foundation, you can do, you can work really fast at solving those real problems. Uh, and he has good process and good organization. I mean it's not just you know, a visionary just, you know, shouting from the, the mountaintop. Like, he, he he runs a good company, too, on top of having those foundational elements. You know, when you think about the, those people that are saying rich guys going to space, you think about Elon, the investment that he's made in technologies. When I think about the $250 million to St. Jude, the impact this is going to have on your company, the impact it's going to have on your clients, the impact this has on consumers and all of our lives. You know, I say God bless those people that are taking these steps and going forward, Jared. So as your friend, I'm incredibly proud of what you've accomplished this year. You know, I'm incredibly proud of the spark that you've lit and, uh, lighted in all of us. There's this interest in the space program again that really wasn't there six months ago. And the other companies didn't create it like Inspiration4 did. So, so uh, you're sort of the face of civilian space flight now. And I, I guess you're looking at that as a responsibility to perpetuate this, correct? Well, I, I think that, you know, I just feel super lucky to play a very, very small part in the history that really SpaceX is making. The, the visionaries there 20 years ago to have the foresight to say that, you know, they need to be ahead of this. Look, I, America sent their astronauts to space for 10 years in Russia before SpaceX delivered Dragon. Um, you know, they've given amazing contributions, knowing problems well in advance of anyone else. I feel like we got to play a very small part in that. I, I hope I can continue to play a part in that going forward as well. Yeah, maybe the part was uh, not so big to you, but, you know, to those of us that have watched you, to those little 16-year-old boys, no, I'm serious, and I'm making you blush, that are watching you and watched all this happen, this is no small thing. This is a big thing. So thank you for taking the chance, buddy. Thank you for stepping up for St. Jude, and thank you for being my friend. Thanks, buddy. Appreciate you having me here. This was yeah. wonderful. Good to see you, buddy. Good to see you as well. Wow. So, you know, it's funny how you can have a friend for years, and Jared's my buddy. But that friend goes out, whatever friend goes out, and does something that's just unbelievable. And you realize that, you know, you love your friend, and, and, but you can still gain respect for people, even after you know him for so many years. What Jared has accomplished as a business person, as a philanthropist, as an astronaut, is unbelievable. And I'm so proud to call him my friend. Here's what I learned from this. Jared was a young boy who had an idea for credit card terminals. He took that idea to becoming the first civilian astronaut in history. How many of you have ideas that you haven't, cha that you haven't followed through on? You know, I have a bunch of products now. Our frozen food line launches in Costco this month. I'm very, very proud of it. Take a look. Keep your eyes out for Taffer's Tavern frozen foods at your local Costco. We have my seltzer that's come out now, my mixology product. We have a home portable bar coming out soon that we're very, very excited about. We have a bunch of more frozen food products coming out that we're very, very excited about. We're working on our second flavored whiskey that we're very, very excited about. And I'm not allowed to talk about it, but I can only tell you we have the best partner in the world to do it with. And all of these things happen because I didn't say no. All these things happen because I forced myself to say yes. You know, during this pandemic, we have a lot of reasons to say no. We have a lot of reasons to wait. We have a lot of excuses not to do things. Jared could have had an excuse. He didn't have to make 
uh, inspiration for happened during COVID. He didn't have to do his fundraiser for St. Jude during COVID. He did. So the lesson for me, and for all of you, I hope, is whatever dream you have, you can make it real. Look at what Jared has accomplished. Look what I've accomplished. Don't make your dreams be dreams. Take your dreams and change the word from dream to objective. Make your dream an objective. You see, the word dream makes it unapproachable, doesn't it, Corey? It does, yeah. Dreams aren't real. Dreams don't really happen, do they? But objectives do happen. If you just change the way you think from dreams to objective, maybe you'll be the next one in space. Thanks all for listening. I'm John Taffer. This is the John Taffer Podcast. Again, please hit subscribe so you can get our podcasts every month. And don't forget to send me an email. I'd love to hear from you at podcast at johntaffer.com. That's podcast at johntaffer.com. New Bar Rescue's coming this spring. I'm going to work. See you guys soon. Bye-bye. Hey, 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 hey. No freaking excuses. Don't shut this podcast down. Click here to subscribe or click here to watch more. But do it.